I think the research is pretty clear that we, we do need to act. What does your research tell us about what works in terms of lawyer wellbeing? Where should we be focusing our collective attention? I think it's clear it's not a one size fits all solution. So um, the Life in the Law survey in the UK indicated the best results where you have a kind of toolkit of wellbeing tools, uh, say for example within a law firm, within a, a legal institution. So that might involve an employee assistance plan, uh, it might involve some kind of events uh, and a programme of, you know, um, upskilling people in different ways. But there's, there's got to be a little bit of a choice for people about what they take up and when. Um, I think it's also um, much stronger when it's actually embedded into um, a law firm or an organisation's kind of core business. So, for example, you hear lots of anecdotes of a firm bringing in, say, a yoga instructor and everyone's encouraged to go along to this yoga session for an hour and a half, but then they have to work late or they have to work through their lunch if they have a lunch hour, you know, the next few days to, to make up that time because they have all these targets. So it, it's a bit of a sticking plaster and it doesn't really work. What we're looking at is how you integrate that into that core business of a law firm. And that might be, for example, through firms acknowledging work done on well-being through objectives that specifically relate to that. It might be building in time that you can record as doing well-being related work and that's seen as equally valuable as other kinds of client related work. It might be through setting key performance indicators that acknowledge kind of well-being. And very practical things, so I mentioned workload is a huge issue. Some firms do have very good systems where they monitor workload, not in a, a sense of um, criticising people who aren't picking up enough hours, but much more in the sense of, well, this person's clearly got too much on at the moment, this, this, this person's got some capacity, let's share this out a little more equally, and just keeping it using sometimes a traffic light system, for example, just a really practical way of ensuring that work workload remains manageable. Another key thing that came out of the UK survey was around the value of, of contact on a one-to-one -one basis through regular catch-ups. Um, I think one of the difficulties is often managers within law firms have come up through the ranks because they are great lawyers and they know all about the law and legal problem solving, but they've not necessarily had the training and the support to become the best managers they could be. So I think part of it goes back if we train those managers so they have those really strong interpersonal skills, they have that understanding around well-being, they can spot early cues that maybe something isn't right, they understand how it relates to the wider business of the law firm, then they can have those one-to-one -one catch ups, they can put in place the support and the communication and that sense you know, of a healthy workplace. Natalie, what do you think works in terms of lawyer well-being? I agree with Emma when she said it's not a, f a one-fits-all solution, but uh, I, I have a transversal conclusion <laughs> to all the solutions that we, we uh, put in place. We have to give the priority to risk factor. The main issue that I observed uh, until 10 years ago now is that many workplace or uh, association work on protective factor, increase resources uh, among legal practitioners because it's easier to increase some resource, to invest, to, to launch and learn and this kind of, of resources. But I think it's Band-Aid at the end. We have, uh, w w when we measure um, the different, uh, w w we made a lot of analysis regarding risk and protective factor. And what we saw is that risk factor explained more than 50% of the variation of psychological distress, depressive symptoms, and burnout. And protective factor explained around 8 to uh, 5 to 8 percent. Uh, in the different models. So it means that we have to prioritize risk factor and among the risk factor, I think that the w w organization of work or work organization is 
the very, very important risk factor. And I, 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 I heard uh, different conferences during the Wellness for Law Forum about the work organization because the work organization will uh, will hollow to. Uh, to give a workload more manageable, but also to decrease the pressure related to emotional demand. Uh, for example, if we have a better team working, we will be able to share the risk about emotional demand on one side, and on the other side, we will be able to increase the support, the close support from peers. So we have to work on work organization, yes. So at the VLSB and C, we are the regulator of lawyers and we are very aware that sometimes interaction with us uh, can be a stress factor for, for lawyers. What advice do you have for us as the regulator in relation to lawyer wellbeing, um, Natalie? I think that we have to, um, to have a better uh, communication practice. For example, because many, particularly for young practitioners, it's maybe it, it, sometimes it's stressful uh, to have some communication with the regulator. So I think that, that the communication practice to prepare the, the, the meeting that we will have sometimes uh, to clarify the expectation to. I think as a regulator, it's really important to be fully cognizant of the significant influence that you can have on lawyer well-being and to treat it as something that permeates all the different uh, activities that you regulate in different ways. So I can give you an example from um, England and Wales that we have the Solicitor Regulation Authority and that um, is the body that regulates over 150,000 solicitors in those two jurisdictions. And it came in for a lot of criticism a few years ago because there were a series of disciplinary cases, mainly against junior uh, solicitors, where basically they had made a mistake during their work. They had then lied and covered up the mistake because they were so scared of the consequences. And a big factor in that was the fact that it was a toxic working environment. And the term toxic was actually used in, in at least one of the, the judgments in relation to the kind of culture that was there. Those solicitors were found to have been dishonest and they were taken from the role of solicitor. So their career was eventually effectively ended. And in a sense, that demonstrates that regulators can have a negative impact because, um, you know, there was a great outcry about this. There was a lot of criticism. There was a lot of concern from junior lawyers because they saw this as something that I know when I was a junior lawyer, I would have been petrified of this. And, and I, I don't know whether it would have made me be more open about my mistakes or more careful to try and hide them, to be perfectly honest. So that sounds quite negative, but actually from that, the Solicitor Regulation Authority began a thematic review into workplace culture. And they developed um, a lot of guidelines that were really valuable and useful. They drew on a lot of expertise within the legal sector, both academic and from practitioners. To, um, and it, they brought together this really useful toolkit effectively. They then went on and last year they changed the code of conduct for solicitors and they introduced for the first time obligations around being respectful at work, respecting your colleagues, working well together and for managers to challenge uh, inappropriate behaviour in the workplace. Now, it's too early to see how that will actually play out because we haven't, you know, people are still adjusting, but it certainly changed the narratives around those issues within England and Wales. They're already much more prolific. There's much more discussion. There's a sense that firms have to take wellness as seriously as possible because there are these significant consequences if the code of conduct is breached. So that's an example of a regulator potentially having a really positive impact and it just shows the level of influence that they can have. We, uh, we work quite closely with the Solicitors Regulation Authority, so um, we'll be sure and look at that, uh, that code. So it'd be great to finish our time with uh, something positive um, and an example perhaps of where you've seen uh, positive change occurring in well, uh, lawyer wellbeing. I think um, sometimes when I've been talking about the surveys that have been done by the IBA in the UK, it's, it's, it can kind of sound quite negative but actually what certainly the IBA survey showed was that a lot of legal organisations are putting in place um, initiatives around well-being um, 
those that hadn't already got them in place were planning to put them in place. And bear in mind, these surveys were conducted during COVID-19. And I actually think to some extent that was a catalyst to um, encourage organisations to take workplace wellbeing um, even more seriously. And I think some of that work has continued. When I look at, at the, the initiatives that are going on in the UK, there's a lot of positive discussion. There's a lot of talk about things like flexible working and remote working and how to harness the ongoing benefits of that where, whereas also you know bringing in um, this kind of need for social connection and dialogue that's st are still important. One example I would just like to highlight because I think it's marvellous is the Law Society of Ireland. So I think they are a great exemplar of the kind of work that can be done across a whole jurisdiction because they train um, young lawyers coming into the profession and Everybody who goes through that training has access to a counsellor. They undertake a, a core module, which is looking is all around lawyer well-being and how that plays out in the workplace. But then they offer support and provision throughout the whole of the legal life cycle, right through to, to retirement and beyond. So, you know, I would suggest people um, Google that because it's a great example. I think that in Canada, the, this research lead to a cultural shift uh, for sure. And uh, particularly uh, about the, the, these results, we saw that some law society include wellness as a core competency of their competency guide. It's the case, for example, for the Law Society of Alberta. Um, it leads also to initiatives uh, among, um, in the law school uh, to change their uh, academic curriculum. Uh, for example, to include some uh, course um, throughout their um, academic curriculum. Uh, one credit by year for each year uh, of the training um, to develop some skills related that will improve the ability of uh, professionals to manage their stress during their career, to valorize different kind of practice. Right? It's not one fits all, uh, like the the, 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 the the action that we, we made for increase the wellness and law. It's the same for practitioners. Uh, it's not one fits all, so we have to valorize a different kind of practice, practice in public sector, in, in private sector, uh, in some uh, professional association too. Um, and uh, we also um, we also saw uh, some initiatives in the private sector. Uh, one uh, big firm um, in Canada uh, developed a, a heads of wellness position uh, to develop uh, have a strategic uh, vision of uh, wellness. Uh, so I think that all these actions will contribute uh, to uh, increase wellness and law in Canada for sure and uh, uh, to, to start a cultural shift, yes. I'd like to thank Professor Natalie Cadieu and Dr Emma Jones for sharing the richness of their research and insights with us into this really important topic of lawyer wellbeing. Thank you. <laughs>